a person has lost a, tel uh, lost a mobile phone, if somebody finds said phone, uh, you can let uh, me or somebody know. You have it? Ah, it's up there. Okay, so the, the person who lost it should go over there and get it. <laughs> or not. We can sell the thing, I think. Where'd he go? Yeah, it was a student. Okay, I'll make a note that we have it out here. Okay, so let's go ahead and start session two. And uh, I'm going to introduce one of the chairs, and, um, and uh, Dr. Valsecchi is not here, and his alternate I'm going to let Alan uh, introduce. But anyway, Alan Harris is a senior research scientist. And are you still at the Space Sciences Institute? Uh, no, actually. Ah, I... Then maybe I'll let you introduce yourself then. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's a good plan. Okay, my uh, co-chair, uh, Giovanni Valsecchi, was not able to be here, and so uh, Andrea Milani from University of Pisa will replace him. Uh, I think uh, uh, Andrea is well known to most of you as the, uh, the person who originated and maintains the Neodis uh, site in Pisa, Italy, which runs somewhat in parallel to the JPL sentry system or whatever they call it now and uh, uh, it lets us know in advance if we're all going to die and so uh, uh, if, if one's coming tomorrow ask Andrea he may have a secret okay well I'm also it seems the first speaker here so I guess I'm sort of self-introduced uh, and by the way, where I'm not at Space Science Institute anymore. I'm working in a small little company that three of us founded to do research on asteroids and other wonderful stuff, uh, which we call more data because we have a telescope farm out in the desert with 10 telescopes and we pump data from asteroids, light curves mostly. And um, so that's what I'm doing now, although in principle I'm sort of retired, or I keep trying to be retired. Let me see how this all works here. There we go. Today I want to give you an update on the <clears throat> uh, population of near-Earth asteroids and the progress of surveys, which are, is actually one and the same question, because you know how many objects you've discovered of a given size, and if you can estimate what fraction of the total population that represents, you simultaneously obtain an estimate of the total population and the fraction of completion of the current survey as a function of size of objects. Now the way I do this is I uh, run a survey simulation where we try to match the characteristics of existing surveys reasonably closely, although not desperately closely and then run that simulation for, on the computer for 20 years of, of survey time. And then in the last two years of that simulated survey, I tabulate the fraction of the objects being detected synthetically by the survey uh, to the uh, total number of detections. In other words, what is the fraction of new object discovery compared to ones you already knew? Now that turns out to be a very stable number because uh, the if you just imagine you go out and you shoot a picture of the sky, if you count up the total number of objects you detect and how many of those did you know before you took that picture, that ratio should be the completion, the fraction of the total number of objects that exist out there. Well, not quite, because asteroids are not like marbles in a box that are all equally likely to be picked out. Some are easier to find than others, and you tend to find easy ones first. So what we end up with, I think this is a laser pointer, is it? Yeah, it would appear to be. What we end up with is a curve of completion versus magnitude or brightness, size of object like this. We get a completion curve that is sort of an S-shaped curve like this. And the redetection ratio is always higher than the completion because, remember, you've discovered the easy ones first, and so you redetect the ones that were easier more often. But in the survey simulation, it's perfectly possible to tabulate both the redetection ratio 
and the completion, because you know how many objects you put into the survey, so you know the true completion as well as the redetection ratio. And once you do that, you can then turn to uh, a real survey, that is the surveys that are going on right now, and you can look up in the Minor Planet Center and tabulate of all of the objects seen by a survey in the last two years, how many of them were redetections of already known objects? And so here we have the data plots that are actually the determined just tabulations from the surveys of how many objects or what fraction of objects were redetections versus how many are fresh uh, discoveries. And the little dots here follow the theoretical curve very satisfyingly close. And so what we do then is we slide the dots here horizontally, they're plotted versus the H magnitude of the individual objects. We just adjust those until they match to the uh, model curve. And then the dashed line curve here, which represents the true completion, we take that to be completion versus H magnitude. And that gives us the measure of how we're doing in the survey. And we can then uh, just do the inversion of the total number of objects detected in each size bin, divide by that completion curve, and come up with the numbers. Well, <clears throat> uh, up until the last time or so that I've done this, I was using boxes, magnitude-wide boxes of a half magnitude. And I was going like from 17.0 to 17.5, 17.5 to 18, and so on. Well, it turns out the Minor Planet Center rounds off magnitudes, almost all of them, to 0 0.1 mag. And if you stop and think about that, uh, on one side or the other of the box, you use less than or equal to, and on the other side, you use just less than. And so that implicitly, because of round off, shifts the box by 0 0.05 magnitude. And that uh, seemingly small shift changed the estimated uh, numbers of objects from 990 to when I rebend things differently to get rid of that effect to 934. And the good news that Lindley was really pleased to have is that my estimated completion jumped from 88% to 93% using the very same set of data. This had only to do with the rebinning. And so uh, my latest current estimate now is that we are about 93% complete of things larger than H of 17.75 and uh, reduced the number remaining to be discovered by a full factor of two from around 118 to now only about 62. And even that's about a year old. So uh, when I redo it, we'll have numbers even smaller than that. This shows you, illustrates the effect of round off. This little red curve is if you plotted uh, number versus H magnitude out of the Minor Planet Center, it would follow this thing here and the, the horizontals are only because of round off. And what you really should be following is this green curve up the middle. Before I was following this black curve here, and another fellow, uh, Tricorico, who recently did it, made the opposite assumption of less than equal to, and he came up with numbers that were even lower than, my, than the reality. So we've now corrected that problem, and here's what we've got. This is the current population estimate. Uh, the <coughs> red, most prominent, I hope, red s symbols, are the most recent estimate that I made uh, with the rebinning of magnitudes. And you can see that the, it really makes almost no difference when you get down here, if you wanna know how often does Chelyabinsk happen or how often does Tunguska size happen, it makes no real difference, 10% difference in time estimate, and we really don't know it that well. But up here in the large size where we're at 95% or 93% complete, it makes the difference between 88% complete and 93% complete. And that makes a big difference to people who are trying to assess the probability of the remaining risk of undiscovered objects, or from undiscovered objects. Well, the last thing that I will bring up here is a conversion of the size frequency distribution from absolute magnitude H to diameter D. We heard a little bit about that this morning uh, regarding 50 meters and what does 50 meters diameter mean? Well, it depends on the albedo. Uh, the NEOWISE uh, uh, effort has given us a pretty good distribution of albedos. And as was mentioned this morning, it tends to be bimodal. 
So just taking a mean value here, which is around 0.08 or 0.09, turns out to fall in a valley, and, and you're almost certainly wrong if you make the average assumption. What we'd like to do is invert the distribution of number size frequency versus uh, H and make a size frequency distribution in terms of diameter. Now that doesn't tell you anything about the any one specific object, but it does give you better statistical counts of how many objects of a given size there are out there. Well, I started doing this, if you take a look at, this is the distribution of NEAs with measured albedo versus diameter. Doesn't seem to be any trend there. It looks like you could make the assumption that albedo is constant over size, and certainly within the noise it is. However, over here I've plotted up all 415 observed objects, this distribution, you get a mean albedo of 0.147. Then if you ask, what is the mean albedo and the distribution of objects larger than one kilometer, you get a somewhat different answer, 0.126. Well, that doesn't seem like a very big difference, but when you do the mathematical inversion of the size frequency distribution using those two distributions of albedo, you get answers that differ by like 10% or so. And so if you ask the question, how many objects of diameter greater than one kilometer are out there, using one of those distributions, you get something like 900 and low 900 numbers, which seems reasonable. You use the other distribution, and you get 850 or some number like that. So uh, it's very hard to give a definitive answer in terms of what is the true numerical count of objects larger than a given size. And that's a bit distressing to me. It's a work in progress. I'm still trying to tune up the albedo distribution so I can give a better answer to that. But one thing that you can see is that if you just do that inversion and then slide the two scales to make the best matchup between diameter and H magnitude, in this case it's about H of 17.5 rather than 75, and the two curves have essentially the same shape, so it doesn't seem to make too much difference. And so using a proxy of what H magnitude corresponds to a D of one kilometer, once you decide what proxy transition you're gonna use, the shape remains pretty close to the same. Okay, there is the summary. I don't need to really read that to you. I'll just leave it on display, and if anybody has a quick question, I think I have a minute or two to spare. It turns out it's a, first of all, it's a very small number. We have statistics enough of the interior objects to know that it's a fairly small fraction. Another thing that I would say is that for the impact hazard, we're not terribly interested in objects that are substantially inside the Earth's orbit. It's a very interesting scientific question. But if they don't come out to one AU, they can't hit the Earth. And so they're really not part of the impact hazard. Uh, for the very same reason, I tend to discount the Amor objects because they don't make it into the Earth's orbit. And they, it turns out, Amors have a distinctly different albedo distribution. So when you try to do this trans transformation, things get all screwed up. And so I try to restrict myself to what amount to Apollos and Ottens, that is, things that truly cross the Earth's orbit. Alan, quick question. Um, you showed the, uh, the albedo there at the end, and maybe I missed it, but you derived a 0.177 albedo. Could you describe that? Because that's a little bit higher than is typically used, um, like at JPL, um, in their size estimation, which is like 14%. Um, I, I, one, well, this plot here has a mean albedo of all of the objects of 0.147, and what we have been assuming for that equivalence of point uh, of between one kilometer and H of 17.75, that works out to be a mean albedo transition of 0.14, I believe, and that's real close onto that number. 
Excuse me? Which... Um, it's not... Uh, this thing is not responding. What's going on? Oh, it's got some... Yeah. No, that is not, in fact, a typo. That turns out to be the mean albedo if you work backwards when you do the transition and then shift them over. And so the mean, it, it basically relates to the fact the mean doesn't have too much meaning, you know, because the distribution is not bell-shaped. It's bimodal. <laughs> so it kind of makes everything crazy. Should you use maybe the median? I don't know. You know it's, when you have non-Gaussian statistics, the mean doesn't really mean a lot. <laughs> this guy here is an expert on that. <laughs> okay. I think we can switch to the next speaker. Thank you. I don't know. Your mic is on. Yeah, here you go. Sorry? Your microphone is pushed up. Hold it up. Hello. It's on now. Okay. Okay. We can... Uh, Call on the next speaker, which is uh, Robert Werk, Werick, I'm not sure the pronunciation, I apologize, from uh, University of Hawaii. All right, I'm going to talk about linking the isolated tracklet astrometry that the MPC has. Uh, so everyone knows there's two big surveys, PanStars and Catalina. Uh, they both currently find the majority of new asteroids. However, one issue we have is um, a lot of the times to discover new objects, we rely on the follow-up capabilities of other telescopes. This is especially true for near-Earth objects. At least with PanStars, we don't actually do our own follow-up. Um, so there are a lot of objects that if they're not followed up, then they get dumped into what's called the isolated tracklet file that the MPC has. This is a file that contains over 13 and a half million detections that are unlinked to any object. And of course, this presents a rich source for data mining purposes, which is what uh, I've been doing. So the file itself, um, it's basically dominated by PanStars and Catalina um, detections. Uh, this is separate from the data files that contain the astrometry for both unnumbered and numbered objects. Uh, the MPC does eventually link astrometry from this file to all objects when they become numbered, um, but this doesn't happen often enough, and we're also able here to do it over a larger scale. Uh, it is important to note that a lot of the astrometry in this file can actually be quite old. There are objects in here from over 20 years ago. So what we're doing is we're trying to develop a method to actually go through and find new objects which should be known, but they're not known in this file. So this work was first done for NeoCP targets. So a lot of PanStars targets were posted on the NeoCP, and we wanted to say, oh, are any of these objects previously observed? So that's where we started from, and now we've extended it to actually searching through the ITF. So this is an example um, of an object. It's just a randomly chosen object. You know, it's not a straight motion on the celestial sphere. It can curve around. And in this case, there's actually five tracklets that are part of this. So this is an example of where you may see an object over a longer time scale, but on a much shorter time scale, you don't necessarily have the correct number of observations you would need to come up with a definite link. So the, the main importance of this is we want to increase the efficiency of finding NEOs. Um, there's a big issue too with a lot of the objects that appear on the NEOCP, they're not actually NEOs. Um, a lot of the times they can be Hungaria type orbits, even main belt objects appear on there. And it's only until many days later with many follow-up observations that it becomes clear that these aren't NEOs and they're either designated as non-NEOs and removed or they're linked to a previous designation and removed from there. Um, the other important thing from the PanStars point of view is we want to reduce the number of tracklet candidates that we actually manually review. So every asteroid that PanStar submits to the MPC, someone actually looks at the images. There's little um, image stamps cut out on the object just to make sure it's real and it's not an image artifact or something else. 
Uh, and for days around new moon when there's really good weather, this can take hours um, per day. So it is quite an involved task. So being able to identify any of these objects as actually being known would go a, a, a long way to improving our efficiency in detecting other new objects. So the method we're using is, uh, it's basically a brute force computational method. So what we do is we'll start with some random tracklet and we're gonna consider all other tracklets that occur within some distance over some time span. Now this is kind of a loose criteria, but with computer power today, we can actually just break this down and run it on a distributed computer cluster and it'll just run on its own in the background. So that's what we've done. So for this search, we've actually first focused on the lower residual cases. So the idea being if you find two tracklets and you can fit an orbit, the residual of the predicted to actual measurements of the position, you know, it, 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 it'll have a certain accuracy. So if we focus on the cases that are very accurate with the lowest residuals, we can be confident that we're gonna find the most number of, of easy targets first on to remove those as a bulk group. Then we can go back and find additional objects. Um, so once we find these tracklet pairs, they're not necessarily correct, they're just candidates. We then go through and we search for additional tracklets that are moving in a similar motion to what we'd expect from our fitted orbit. And we can do this across multiple oppositions. So this is an example here. Um, there was a, an object here. So if you fit an initial orbit over this, you might expect the motion across the celestial field to celestial sphere to move like this. Now we actually identify there's a particular tracklet over here which is more or less moving in the direction and at the rate of motion you would expect for this object. So our program would then consider that one and fit a new orbit. Now with this new updated orbit you can immediately see there's then a third tracklet that lies very very close to the predicted position. So doing this a large number of times on a distributed computer cluster we can test every possible tracklet um, that occurs in the ITF. So if we do that, we can actually find cases of up to 29 tracklets with over 100 detections of these objects uh, in, in the ITF file. So if we break this down into the number of tracklets um, that form these objects, if you consider objects where we find at least five tracklets, that fit a, a nice orbit, we actually find there's at least 66,000 of these. If you consider four tracklet cases, then we go up to 82,000. So this is a very large number of objects that are potentially new objects, but could also be recoveries or precoveries of existing objects. Now, one important thing we do is we actually require, um, at least for the lower tracklet counts, Every opposition can't have just one tracklet, it has to have multiple tracklets. This increases our confidence in the actual linkings being correct. So if we were to plot out these orbits, we get something that makes sense. Uh, if we make a, his, um, a plot in histograms of inclination versus semi-major axis, the actual tracklets we find in the ITF actually match what you would expect. Uh, there's a very large group here of the Hungarias, that's uh, what we're actually interested in removing first. Um, but you can see there is the, the inner, the middle, and the outer belt structure. So the Hungaria. So there are many cases of these. So again, these are objects which often get posted to the NEOCP. Um, Follow-up telescopes spend a lot of time observing these, and then they just get removed as non-NEOs or linked to something else. Um, a lot of times, too, they don't necessarily get linked to an existing designation before. They may get a new designation and eventually one day linked to an old one. So you can actually have multiple designations of the same object in the MPC database. So this type of work would help with that. Um, an example of this, oh, so, so I found about 1,200 of these so far. An example of this is 2007 YN52. Uh, I actually found it as four tracklets um, at a much later date. If you were to take the orbit that the MPC has for this and say where is that object on these later days, it's actually 40 degrees away from the predicted position. Uh, but if you work in reverse, if you take the orbit fitted from these and go backwards, it's actually very close within like arc minutes of where you'd predict it moving in the correct direction. So we're fairly confident that a lot of these objects we can identify as previously known objects or to identify them as new objects, in which case they would be removed from the NEOCP sooner. 
Now, of course, the most important thing we want to do is to find all the NEOs that are in this file. So there's a real issue where we want to know if there's NEOs hiding in plain sight. So what we mean by this is there's something called the digest score, which basically ranks an object as the likeliness that it is an NEO. So usually with the MPC, if your digest score is less than 65%, they don't consider it as an NEO and they won't post it on the NEOCP. So could there be objects where the digest score is less than the 65, but there's still NEOs? That's what we want to find out. Now, because NEOs are usually a lot fainter, we don't expect to see them as many times. So a lot of NEOs might only be seen in three tracklets or four tracklets, certainly not up to 29 tracklets, otherwise they should have been previously identified. So I have two examples just to show some, and two NEOs that, that are, should be known, but they're actually not. So this object here was observed by W84 in 2013. It's actually very close to being a borderline PHA, but it's actually not a known object. But yet there's three tracklets that fit very well over a shorter period of time. So this is an example of something we should know, but we don't. Another example is a PanStars one. So this one's not a PHA, it's, it's getting closer to being a borderline NEO, but it should be known, but it's not. So uh, we actually want to find out about uh, how many of these there are. So um, our search was kind of disrupted because our computer cluster was moved between islands in Hawaii. So there was a little pause with this work. Um, but we're currently still computing all these possibilities. So of the results we found so far for the easy objects, we found about 1,200 of the Hungarias. And there's about 100 NEOs so far, but we're expecting there might be some more. Now, the real issue with the NEOs, though, is it's a lot harder to automatically verify. So for now, we're just gonna be manually verifying all these cases, but we hope to find a lot more. And then after this, we're gonna focus on the more difficult cases. So in summary, for the five plus tracklet cases, we've already found 66,000 linkages, up to 80,000 something if you consider the four tracklet cases. And this actually represents about a quarter of the ITF file. So once we've gone through and submitted this to the MPC and have them merge it with the existing astrometry, we're going to go back and then focus more on the NEOs and the other objects which are more difficult to find. So, are there any questions? Microphone. There on the top. It seemed that the ones that uh, you uh, had trouble finding are the ones that weren't there when they were supposed to be, or, or vice versa, however you want to count it, were the ones that were more elliptical orbits. Is that true, or just an impression for the ones that you gave as examples? Wait, sorry, what do you mean? Uh, it seems the one you said that we should have found but weren't there Oh, okay. were, so were much more elliptical than... For, for, the, for the NEO? Yeah. Oh, in the one case of the NEO, um, so another thing is if you don't actually submit an NEO to the NEOCP, it won't actually get posted there. It'll just go right into the ITF file. So there could be objects that were found later when the images were analyzed that were never presented to the follow-up observers. Yeah. Okay, maybe another question. Have you uh, tried this with other cases besides uh, the data set that you have shown? And have you followed up on any of these with any other observations to validate there might be something there? Uh, well, the actual method itself, I applied it to find TNOs in the PanStars data set, but I haven't considered other data sets for this. So um, one thing to do is, so right now I'm just running it using the ITF data alone, but if you then take all the objects and run it against the unnumbered database, that's when you can find which are actually like recoveries or precoveries of known objects. Okay, thank you. We can have the next speaker. <laughs> so, next speaker is Davide Farnocchia, who was in Pisa until 2012 with me, and now is at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Okay, thanks, Andrea. Okay, I'm glad to be here and talk about Scout. Scout is a system we developed at JPL in the last couple of years. 
And the goal is to provide the earliest possible warning for potential impactors among new discovered asteroids. But before going into the details, I'm going to challenge everyone here. Here we have three sequences of observations for three different asteroids. A main belt asteroid, a regular ordinary near-Earth object, and an impactor. Can you guess which one is which? Or at least, can you guess which one is the impactor? I'll give you a couple of seconds before giving the answer. Shh, shh, shut up if you know. Okay, and here's the answer. The impactor is the one at the bottom. So how many of you got it right? Wow, and this is the crowd in charge of planetary defense. <laughs> okay, no, it's not that easy, but we can do it, and I'll show you how. Well, the reason why we want to try and identify possible impactors from this limited data set, only a few observations, is that sometimes timing can really be important. And just to show an example, we have, we've only had two objects discovered prior to an impact. The first one was 2008 TC3, discovered in October 2008, who ended up breaking up on the Nubian Desert. And the second one was 2014 AA, and this one ended up in the Atlantic Ocean. So in both cases, the objects were pretty small, five meters, so not really a threat from a planetary defense perspective. Uh, amazingly, they were discovered by the same person, Richard Kowalski, of the Catalina Sky Survey, and both of them only 20 hours before the impact. So 20 hours was the whole time available to get the observations, try and identify the possible impact, get more data to refine the orbit, and eventually decide to do something about it. Not much time. Now, of course, five meters is kind of the small range, and, but we saw from Alan's presentation that objects that are small are the ones that are more likely to come close to the Earth and have impacts. So even objects like uh, Tunguska or chelyabinsk size objects can be more frequent, and they're, it's quite possible that you're going to see them only on their final approach to the Earth. And so you really need to be fast and get and recognize the impact as soon as possible. So how do we do that? Well, surveys are going to sc scan the night sky, get observations of what they think is going to be a new object. They submit their data to the Minor Planet Center, and the Minor Planet Center does something really sensible to do. They put this object in the so-called confirmation page, because at the very first, when you only have a few observations, you cannot be sure the object is real, so you want to get additional data, possibly by other observers as well. You get a good idea of the orbit, and at that point, you announce the object, and and you can try and do predictions, hazard assessment, and these kind of things. Well, Scout tries to do some sort of data mining from the confirmation page. We get the data as soon as they're available, and we try and find possible orbits and possible impacts for those objects. And doing that is not that easy, because uh, the orbit determination problem is kind of degenerate. Usually, we like to have our long data set, many observations. We do our best fit. We have an ellipsoid as an uncertainty region, and we map that into the future, and we know what's going on. But in this case, as we saw, you only have a few observations in the sky, and so you know the angular position of an object, you know the angular motion, but you don't have information on the distance to the object, which is what we call range, and the radial velocity which is what we call range rate. If we add these two numbers, we could compute an orbit. But without it, we can't. And so what we can do is to take a grid of range and range rate points, and for each grid point, we can compute an orbit. And so we get a kind of a distribution of possible orbits to be analyzed. Now, 2014 AA, this was the second impactor I was mentioning. This is our grid. So for each grid point, we compute the orbit. And we can, for instance, identify the, or the orbits that are elliptical. So that red curve is for parabolic orbits. Whatever is inside is an elliptical orbit. But if you know the orbit, we also know if it's going to come close to the Earth. And so you can see that green curve corresponds to the grazing impacts. Whatever is on the left is on an impact trajectory. Now, 2014 AA only had seven observations. But here you can see from the RMS of the fit that you have a clear indication of where the actual orbit is, even though you only have seven observations. And so there is a clear minimum corresponding to an impact trajectory. Uh, if you fold in the expected quality from Catalina observations, which is about 0.5 arc seconds, you can see that the 0.5 arc second region and smaller RMS, it's all within the impact region. So there is a clearly a strong indication this was an impactor. 
Uh, the other thing we're saying is that this is kind of an exceptional case because with seven observations we get this kind of constraint. In general, you might have a more dispersed distribution of orbits, but still, using a Bayesian approach and given how well you fit the data, you can get a distribution on orbits and do statistics. So, for the two objects that were impactors and were discovered before impact, this system would have worked pretty well. TC3, the first set of observations, it's only four observations over 43 minutes. The impact probability is already 4%. 4% is quite high enough, at least, to trigger a request for additional observations. And as soon as you get them, you get to seven observations over about 100 minutes, and that gives you 100% impact probability. So that's pretty fast response and identification of the threat. Uh, 2014 A8s, similar story. First set of observations is only three over 28 minutes. The impact probability is 3%. You ask for more observations, you get four more. You have seven observations total over 70 minutes, and that gives you 100% impact probability. And what I really want to stress is that you get this kind of information almost right away. Once the object shows up on the confirmation page of the Minor Planet Center, you get the data, and within 10 minutes, usually even less than that, you get the, the analysis incomplete, and you get the information. I get alerts by email, even text messages that sometimes wake me up at night, sometimes that doesn't work very well, but so I should set up a phone call or something like that, but anyway. Uh, this is a nice example of how the system can work well. Uh, 2015 VY105, it was discovered in November 2015 at 7.50 a.m. And only 45 minutes later, I got an alert from the system saying that this object could be coming close. And sure enough, we got more data. Let's see if I can start the video. This was not on an impact trajectory, but it came pretty close to eight geostationary satellites. So this is kind of thing you would like to see from the system. If something's coming that close, you know as soon as possible, and if you need to take some mitigation step, you can do it with the maximum warning time. Scout is available on the web. Anybody can go and check the data from the system. For each NEOCP object, we provide some kind of metrics that kind of inform what observers should go after to uh, constrain the trajectory better. The first one is an impact rating. It's a number from zero to four that kind of put the object in the right category from an impact uh, perspective. We get other pieces of information like the close approach distance. Maybe the object is not on an impact trajectory, might, 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 but it might be coming very close within the geoset ring. It can be, come within the Earth, the lunar distance, and these kind of things. And so those might be the most interesting object to track. Um, some people are interested in objects that are mission accessible, and so we compute the MOID, which is the minimum distance between the orbits of the object and the Earth, and the relative velocity at close approach. And if these two numbers are small, there's good chances the, this object could be mission accessible, and so those might get priority. And we also compute other things like scores for the probability that the object is a PHA, potentially hazardous asteroid, uh, probability of being on a geocentric orbit. That could be actually interesting because it could be an artificial object that we think it's an asteroid and in fact it's not. Or it could be an asteroid that is temporarily captured by the Earth and there is a lot of people that are interested in these objects. And of course, once you determine that one of these objects deserve more observations, you want to know where to look in the night sky. And uh, doing an ephemeris prediction is not that easy because you don't have a nice ellipse in the sky. You might have a very strange uncertainty region. So we provide these plots. If you're an observer, you click, you ask for an ephemeris at the time you want, and you get this kind of uncertainty region. And so you can organize your observations in order to cover the full uncertainty region and make sure you get the object. So to sum up, Scout is a system that we developed recently with the goal of early detection of possible impacts, uh, but also we try and identify close approachers, objects that are mission accessible, uh, mini moons that are objects on a geocentric orbit for a while and these kind of things. The orbit determination problem is not that easy, so we use this technique called systematic ranging, where we scan a grid in range and range rate and compute possible orbits. It's fast, you get an alert within 10 minutes, and, uh, and it's fully automated, it's working just fine. Uh, 
we deal with objects that are still on the NEO confirmation page, so it is possible that the object doesn't exist, which is kind of strange. You get an alert, oh, there is a possible impact, and then the object turns out not to exist. That's the nature of the objects on the confirmation page. If you want an early alert, you have to deal with possible unreliable objects, and we also provide an ephemeris tool to support observers in the follow-up effort to make sure we, we get the orbits of these guys. And with that, I'll take questions. Before the, the question, I would like to make a comment. In, uh, it was mentioned in one of the previous talks that uh, explosion in the atmosphere at a one kiloton level are 20 to 30 per year. Uh, sorry, two to three per year. So in, uh, since 2008 to today, we should have found uh, more than 20. So the level of efficiency of detection of objects of this size five meters is about 10%. And this gives you an idea of how much we could improve. Okay, questions? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll extend a comment on yours and take a question. For yes, sir. Well, yeah, I, uh, when TC3 first came in, I did an estimation just on, based on the current surveys of what is the detection probability, and it turned out it was about 10% or so, so that the numbers actually line up. But about once a decade, you should actually see one coming. Yes. But in the future, I hope we see many more. <laughs> Not that many All right. more. Over here, I'll, so fantastic, I love this stuff. I just wanted to make sort of get a comment from you. This is about short-term impactors. I wouldn't want people to get the idea that you're gonna predict an impact 50 years in the future from a 29-minute arc. No, so we're not gonna do it. This is for things no. that are going to impact in the next it's week or so, right? More than a week, it's 30 days. Okay, so, so you're going out, to, you have to 30 days for this check? Yeah. Okay, yeah, perfect. 30 days is the horizon for okay, thank searching you. for impacts. Okay. So may I summarize your talk that uh, Scout is capable to uh, have with very high probability to forecast collision using only very short, very short arc. You, you mean one degree is a very short arc? It's, is, this, is it true? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. kind of... It really, so the better the astrometry, yeah. so if the astrometry is high quality, we should be able to see that with more confidence and uh, the longer the arc, the better. But if there is an impact, we should see it. At least the two examples we know so far, it worked pretty well. Yes, it is difficult to, for, to, to believe from first slide, but not this. Yes, uh, I also would like to make a comment. This is true because the object is already very close. So if you see an object for one hour, when it is at one AU distance, the orbit is complete rubbish. But if the object is already at less than 0.1 AU, then the information is much more important. If it's moving very fast, it cannot be too far. The so. content of the information is much larger. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you to our speaker. And the next one is uh, David Dolan from the University of Hawaii. Please. Okay, just a few introductory words. If you want to know where that asteroid and when it's going to hit you, you need to have a reliable orbit. And the orbit is computed from observations, most of which, not all, but most of which are made by comparing the position of the asteroid with stars in the same field of view of known position, which means you're at the mercy of the quality of the catalog from which those star positions are derived. Okay, just a, a sample image here. Uh, you take the, the known coordinates of a star, shown on the top here. You do a tangent plane projection to uh, convert them into standard coordinates, and then you do a, a least squares fit to the pixel coordinates, which are shown on the bottom here. And then once you measure the pixel coordinates of your asteroid, you can then use your least squares fit to get the standard coordinates, and then you can undo the tangent plane projection to get your right ascension and declination. 
In reality, we used about two dozen stars out of this, but I only labeled four stars for illustration purposes. Okay, so since we're at the mercy of the catalog, what I want to do is demonstrate the effect that the catalog can have on one particular object, namely Apophis, which has been frequently used as sort of the poster child for killer asteroids. And uh, if you were at the, I think it was the Bucharest uh, Planetary Defense Conference, you may have seen this figure. This shows a bunch of the early observations of Apophis that we made. These are the orbit solution residuals in right ascension on the horizontal axis, declination on the vertical axis, and the units here are arc seconds. And you can see we have a problem. They're systematically to the north. I actually wrote a proposal to study this problem. The recommendation from the review panel was, ah, just send your observations to JPL and let them fit it with a non-gravitational force model. Well, these observations actually span multiple orbits, so it'd be kind of interesting to see what kind of non-gravitational forces can actually displace the orbit plane so that it does not pass through the center of the sun. Interesting. Anyway, the, the catalog in question here was the USNOB 1.0 catalog, and we now know better. This catalog has systematic biases. Uh, they're just, in, at least within the ecliptic region where most of the Apophis observations were made, the star positions are systematically north by uh, a couple of tenths of an arc second, and that's why we see an offset there. Okay, so what we did was remeasure all of those old Apophis observations against the two mass catalog and a bunch of new observations that had been made since we stopped using USNOB 1.0. And this is uh, the same plot with uh, now the reductions against the two mass catalog. And it's, it's a lot better. There's more points. It's not the exact same data set. It has the old data plus some new data. But I think you can probably detect there's still a slight bit of an offset there towards the north. And then in 2012, you'll recognize this. This is from Milani et al. 2012. This is PanSTARS, uh, thousands of numbered asteroids in which they plotted the average residual in right ascension, the average residual in declination against its place on the sky. And the conclusion from these plots was, we think we've uncovered biases in the two mass catalog. Well, not so fast. We actually plotted up 12 years worth of proper motion and uh, tried to construct uh, these plots in the same way that these plots were constructed and the, uh, the similarities are striking. There's some, there are some slight differences, but the, the overall the similarities are striking. So the two mass catalog does not have proper motions in it. It was just a single epic catalog. And the mean epic was, oh, 1998 to 1999. And the mean epic of the PanSTARRS observations, which used the two mass catalog to do their astrometry, was about 2010, 2011. So I did 12 years worth of proper motion to construct these things. And basically the conclusion here is the astrometry has gotten good enough to where a decade's worth of proper motion can't be ignored. And it also helps to explain why the Apophis observations were slightly off to the north as well. Now for, for Apophis, the uh, mean epoch was probably around 2005, 2006, and so we're only looking about half as much proper motion. And if you take half of this plot, well, that pretty much shows the offset you were seeing in the, uh, in the Apophis observations measured with respect to two mass. So along comes the PPMXL catalog, which combined a re-reduction of the USNOB 1.0 with two mass. And we thought, great, this is just what we need. It's hopefully going to get rid of the biases that are in the USNO catalog, and it includes the proper motions. And so we don't have to worry about the lack of proper motions. And we were working with PPMXL pretty successfully for quite a while, feeling pretty good about it until Christmas Day 2013. And here are a set of residuals for, well, there's a couple from the couple days before and a couple from a couple weeks later. But these five observations here, negative 0.3 arc second, and that is probably about six to seven sigma based on the estimated quality of the observation. And boy, this just took the wind out of our sails. At this point, we pretty much stopped measuring Apophis against 
the PPMXL catalog. We just said we have to wait for something better to come along. Well, fortunately, as of September 14th, something better has come along, and it's the Gaia catalog. And here is a set of residuals for Apophis measured against the Gaia catalog. And uh, just to show you the difference again more rapidly, there's USNOB 1.0, there's 2MAS, there's Gaia. I think you can see it with your eye how much better it's gotten. So here are some statistics. There are 212 uh, points in that plot I just showed you. The data span 2013 January 12th through 2015 March 26th. The epic of the Gaia catalog is 2015.0, so there's less than two years with a proper motion. That's significant because the DR1, data release one, of the Gaia catalog does not have proper motions for like 99.9% .9 of the stars in there. We have to wait for DR2 to uh, get that uh, proper motion information. The RMS of the orbit solution residuals is 57 milliarc seconds. Our, our typical error bar is about 54 milliarc seconds, so we're not quite explaining all of the error. Reduced quite a chi-squared statistic, about 1.09. That's uh, the, the last bit of unmodeled uncertainty is probably due to tracking inconsistency or sometimes we're observing through cirrus clouds and possibly the absence of proper motion information in the uh, Gaia DR1 catalog. Uh, can there be bias in the Gaia catalog? Well, we certainly hope not, but until we get DR2, it's going to be difficult to distinguish bias from the absence of proper motion. However, the good news is it solves the Christmas 2013 problem. There's the same set of observations that I showed previously, and you can see the residuals don't have that negative 0.3 right ascension offset anymore. So uh, catalog bias hopefully will become a thing of the past with the uh, Gaia catalog. And uh, just some fringe benefits from using the Gaia catalog. Now pretty much every star in the sky is a photometric standard, at least in white light. Um, so we got a pretty good photometric calibration now and hundreds of brightness measurements that I'm hoping we can uh, put to good use, maybe do some shape modeling of Apophis because uh, we'll have a nice internally consistent photometric data set. Uh, there are probably close to 500 observations we made prior to 2013 that we can re-measure against Guide, dating all the way back to discovery in 2004. But because of the absence of proper motion, we don't want to do that until DR2 is available, which is scheduled for uh, April 2018. And we also hope we can include an empirical model for the uncertainties to get a better idea uh, as to what the true uncertainties are in the observations. And lastly, just a bit of an advertisement. If you'd like to use the Gaia catalog, you can download it from the ESA Gaia website. It's about 200 gigabytes, but once you decompress it, it turns into about half a terabyte. That's a lot of data, and there's a lot of information in there, which is possibly interesting, but not necessarily useful for doing uh, asteroid astrometry. So I created a custom catalog, which I've squeezed into 32 gigabytes. It's got a full billion sources in there. And uh, it's got all the positions, all the proper motions, which are mostly zero in DR1, the magnitudes, all the uncertainties, and the reference epoch, which is mostly 2015, for all billion sources. And it's all in 32 gigabytes, and that is available. If you'd like to know how to get your hands on it, uh, grab me at the conference. And that's all. Thank you. Also, I'm sorry, but I have a comment again. Uh, as you have done a wonderful job. There is one thing on which I disagree with you, and also with uh, Steve Chesley, David Farnocchia, the others who have worked on, on this. What you are removing is not proper motion. Proper motion is each star going its way. What you are removing is average proper motion of a portion of the sky. And this average proper motion is called in another way is the rotation of the sun around the center of the galaxy. Well, proper if, you, if, you, if you plot the average proper motion as a function of the position of the sky, you see a very regular shape, which indicates the direction of the motion 
of the sun with respect right. to average stars around. Right. So there's, it is the direction of the orbit of the sun around the center of the galaxy. Right, there's two components to proper motion. One is the motion of the observer, Yes. Okay. and the other is the motion of the object you are observing. Yes. So yes, yes. But, okay, so the, but the, the absence of proper motion in the catalog is, is still an issue, regardless okay. of what how... What you did is perfect, yeah. but what you have removed is the average proper motion, not the proper motion, and therefore, astrophysically, is a phenomenon every astronomer knows. The galaxy is rotating. Come on, it's not a stationary thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, average motion. <laughs> um, any, any other questions? Oh, okay, sorry, we have to move on. Thank you. Uh, why, don't, why don't you introduce Richard and then I'll take over. Okay. Okay, so Richard Vainscott from University of Hawaii and, well, Project Pan Stars, I think should be mentioned. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to tell you about the current status of PanStars. Um, as you, most of you are probably aware, PanStars has the largest digital camera in the world, almost 1.4 billion pixels. Uh, here's a picture of John Tonnery, who's the next speaker, holding the focal plane of the, the camera. Have a seven square degree field of view. Um, it's not the most cosmetically perfect camera, unfortunately, and the Effective fill factor is about 70%, so some stuff can slip through our large focal plane. There's a, a picture of the sky um, showing some of the cosmetics that we have. The, um, if you see an X in the, in, the, in the cell, it means that it's not usable. And if you see a little movie symbol there, that means there's a bright star and that cell is being used to guide the telescope. You can see there's also some sort of really bad patches in some of the detectors. We also have these, this cell structure in the CCDs, which is not helpful in terms of finding fast-moving objects. If the fast-moving objects transition one of those cell boundaries, it corrupts the detection. We are funded by the NASA Near Earth Object Observations Program, and PanStar started off its life as a sort of mul doing a multi-purpose survey since 2014, just about all of the observing time with PanStars has been searching in a dedicated manner for near-Earth objects. And you'll see later that the discovery rate from PanStars <coughs> increased dramatically with that change. We generally, or at least when the moon is down or the moon is not too bright, we use a very broad filter that spans from 400 to 820 nanometers. We take four 45-second exposures. This is sort of become a tried and true um, exposure time. If we go longer, the asteroids trail. If we go shorter, we, we run into inefficiencies with the read time of, the, of the, the telescope and the slew time between different positions. We're able to now reach down to minus 49 degrees in declination, and we can reach all the way north to, to plus 90, so we can access 87% of the sky. We've discovered about 20% of all the known NEOs um, that have been discovered worldwide to date. And Rob hinted at this in his talk that um, we have to look at all of the unknown detections by hand because of the noise characteristics of the, of the detectors and we have not yet managed to make this aspect of our sort of daily life go away. So it's quite a lot of work to, to examine the NEO uh, candidates from the telescope. This is a, 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 a little picture showing you how much of the sky we can cover in one lunation where each one of those colors is a different night. This is a sort of a lunation with sort of semi-decent weather. Um, many of you who are searching for NEOs will probably agree with me that the weather has not been super good in the last few years. Certainly hasn't been good in Hawaii. Um, so that's about, uh, that, that's February 2016, a sort of an average month. We are very, very dependent on external observers and we're very, very grateful for the um, follow-up observations that all those people make. So if you 
count the NEO discoveries, it's, it's dominated by PANSTARS and by Catalina, but if you look at the NEO observations, we are only responsible for about 25% of them, and there's a lot of people doing a lot of follow-up, and this whole system would not work without the, the follow-up observations. So I just wanted to make it really clear that those people, the work that those people are doing is critically important to this whole picture. Uh, we do try to do some of our follow-up ourselves with, with a Canada France Hawaii telescope, but we don't directly target follow-up observations ourselves. We're inefficient because of the fill factor to do that ourselves. We do do some repeats to help with the follow-up, and as PANSTAS 2 comes online, we will be doing more and more repeats to, to help with this follow-up of, of any of candidates. Just some raw statistics here. We've now submitted over 10 million um, asteroid tracklets, almost 30 million detections. It's seen just about every single numbered asteroid. Um, 470,000 unnumbered asteroids discovered 200,000 asteroids and we now have um, over 5 million detections in the isolated tracklet file. So 19% of our tracklets that we report are not actually linked to a, an object at the moment. And we're detecting up to 12,000 asteroids or submitting up to 12,000 asteroids per night. In a good month we can dis discover more than 100 NEOs, we're very, very weather dependent. So I'll show you a plot in a moment showing what ha the difference in discovery rate between a good, good month and a bad month. We have worked on improving the image quality of PANSTARS-1 and on a good night with good seeing, we can discover NEOs as faint as VF22.5. So this is a his historical um, picture of the NEO discoveries by month since September 2010. So we went into the full-time NEO dedicated work in, in, in 2014. So you see a big increase in discovery happening here. But you can also see some very bad months. So this is um, November and December of 2016, which had particularly poor weather in Hawaii. You see the typical is 60, sort of range 60 to 100. NEO discoveries per month. This is a, a plot of the magnitude of the NEOs that PANSARS discovers. So you're about to hear a talk from John Tonry on ATLAS. So ATLAS is going to be working in, in sort of the fainter than, uh, brighter than magnitude 20. So there's not a lot of overlap in, in what we're discovering with, with what ATLAS will discover, even though it's adjacent basically to, to PANSARS. We have quite a different um, H typical H magnitude of, of the NEOs that PANSARS discovered compared to, to Catalina. So our median H magnitude is 22.8, whereas Catalina is 24.6. So we're good at finding large undiscovered NEOs that are distant and not moving too quickly. But if something is close and, and smaller, um, it's moving more quickly, and we're inefficient at finding those objects. And you can see that pretty dramatically in this histogram where the, the blue lines show PANSTARS discoveries of H magnitude on the, on the X axis. And the red objects, the red, red bars are the Catalina discoveries. So, so we are discovering a lot more of the larger objects. Catalina is efficient at discovering the small objects. If you sort of, in your mind, just sort of offset or, or double Catalina's discoveries to match ours in you can see that we're missing many, many of these small objects. Um, they are hitting the cell boundaries, and even if we see them and we recover them, the positional uncertainty one night later can be quite large. So the, they're very difficult for the follow-up telescopes to discover, to, 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 to get one night later. This is a, a plot of the semi-major axis versus number uh, again, this is against PANSTARS compared to Catalina. You, it shows that Catalina is discovering more of the Artan objects which have faster motions, again showing this inefficiency that we have for, for the fast-moving objects. There's a dramatic number of, or a big spike with, of our discoveries with a period of three years. I'm still trying to digest this. I think these are objects that come into 
um, perihelion on the wrong side of the sun and have been too hard for the smaller telescopes to discover in the past, but we're finding a, a little treasure trove of these objects um, with a period of about three years. So these are objects that have come into to perihelion on the, in the daytime, basically, and are difficult for us to see. So we're able to see them further out, basically. We've had a, a, a careful look at where we're discovering NEOs versus position on the sky. So I have, in, in this plot, this right ascension going from, from zero, degree, zero hours right ascension across to 23 hours right, right ascension here. And we have declination going from extreme southern declination to extreme northern declination. These boxes are approximately equal area on the sky. So at the top, I have the places on the sky where we have dis discovered NEOs. In this section here, I have the number of times that we visited that field. So like everyone else in the, in the business, we have focused perhaps too much on the ecliptic. And in the bottom picture here, we have the, the ratio of the number of NEOs discovered divided by the number of times we visited the field. And you'll see that this is much more even than you would expect. And it shows that there is merit in searching for NEOs well off the ecliptic. And that the, the amount of time that we have been spending on the ecliptic has been too much in the past. And we need to spend more time searching off of the, off of the ecliptic. And it means that there's more discovery space than I think people previously had thought. I think people had commented to us that we, with two telescopes, we're going to be saturating the ecliptic. Uh, of saturating the sky and basically because we can go from plus 90 down to minus 49 there's a lot of sky for us to cover and even with two telescopes we're going to struggle to cover that more than about twice per month. So Panstars 2 is um, almost ready, it's been almost ready for a little bit too long. Yeah. Um, it's, it's in a, uh, a dome which is adjacent to PANSTARS-1, so this is PANSTARS-1, this is PANSTARS-2, and adding the second telescope allows us to basically double the amount of area that we can um, cover every month. Here's, the, the, here's a, a photograph of the telescope. It's a much improved version of, of PANSTARS-1, and what has happened is at the same time as we took the camera back to, to Manoa to refurbish it, we, uh, the, the, the staff in, installed a moon screen, which is a, a necessary part of a, of a wide field telescope to, to basically shade it from the, from the moon. Um, we started off with a sort of sparsely populated focal plane, um, got the telescope working and broke, brought the camera back to Manoa. But there were some packaging problems with some of the CCDs that, that delayed this work. And now we're hoping to be back on the sky in July of this year, uh, in, in June of this year. We are also um, this, uh, um, discovering a lot of comets. So um, PANSTARS has discovered more than half of the new comets. So we're, we're not just searching for near-Earth asteroids, we're searching for near-Earth comets as well. Um, so that was all, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm eager to see John Tonnery's similar plot of where the Atlas system peaks in magnitude of discovery. It should move even further over, but that's a good point. I like that presentation. Uh, are there one, perhaps one quick question, if there's one out there? Yeah, Clark? Oh, excuse me, Dave. More of a comment, back when we were looking at small soul elongations for NEO discoveries, we found an object with an absolute magnitude, I think, of 14 and a half, and we're just shaking our heads going, why didn't somebody else find this first? It turned out it was in one of those three-year orbits. And, you know, whenever it's at perihelion, it's not in the opposition region. And so the surveying at uh, extreme... Uh, angles from opposition was the key, and I guess PANSTARS has been going uh, to smaller soul elongations than surveys in the past has done. So I think that's at least part of the explanation for that spike at, at three years. Yeah, of course, and the, the ultimate of that is the 1.0 year period, or 1.0 something, 
when they're within a couple of hundredths of an AU of one AU, uh, the synodic time period with the Earth is 30 to 50 years, and we haven't been looking that long. And so if you want to find a really biggie one, just keep looking 90 degrees ahead and behind, you know, and it'll either be catching you up or falling behind, and it'll be 30 years until it gets here. But when it gets here, it could be a real honking big one. <laughs> so, I mean... We are also, in part of this is also coming from the fact that we're just surveying further from the ecliptic than, than people have been done and doing in the past. I also comment that we are finding stuff that has periods of four years, six years, eight years as well. So those things are going to take a long time to, to, to get complete. I think we better move on here before we eat up all of John's time. Uh, next talk is John Tonnery. <laughs> with a very simple title, Atlas. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about the Atlas project that's just really now coming online, as you'll see. It's basically funded by NASA to find dangerous asteroids, and uh, it has some funny characteristics. It's uh, two half-meter telescopes that have a very broad field of view, 30 square degrees, and so we can basically, with two telescopes, observe the whole sky twice a night. And the size is very carefully chosen to have a limiting magnitude of 20, so that we provide reasonable warning, like a day or two for the next Chelyabinsk if it's not coming out of the daytime, and maybe a week for the next Tunguska. So that's, that's what ATLAS is. It's intended to be complementary to a lot of these other uh, projects. Um, the thing I have to tell you about is um, we installed the first telescope almost two years ago. It was really awful. The uh, Schmidt corrector was not right. And so we only had a limiting magnitude of 19 and seven arc second images. Ugh. Three weeks ago, we put in a new Schmidt corrector, and I think you'll agree it got a lot better. So finally, three weeks ago, we reached the point where we can actually achieve our design capability. Also, three months ago, we put in the second telescope. So everything that I'm going to be talking about today is from essentially 20 months of somewhat defective telescope, and what we will be doing henceforth is um, considerably more um, and so basically what we've done is we've designed a completely robotic system. It, uh, the two telescopes take a, about a thousand images apiece. It's about a half a terabyte. The uh, telescope opens itself, it observes, it closes if it rains, it reopens if it's good. Uh, the data get completely reduced. Uh, about 30 minutes after an image is taken, the data are ready to be submitted to the Minor Planet Center. And that includes image differencing right through the galactic plane, no problems. You can see all the uh, asteroids that we detect. Um, we use uh, Gaia astrometry and pan stars photometry. So far, we've taken about uh, 300,000 images. So um, I'm going to disappoint you, Al, because our primary mission is astrometry, and we're working on things like large great circle residuals and streaked objects and things like that because we're particularly interested in um, detecting near things. But um, just for fun, because it's a, a planetary defense conference, I thought I'd tell you instead about the Atlas photometry, which is really good. And um, there's other asteroid properties that you can learn from the photometry. So at this point, we've got 9 million detections of 270,000 asteroids. Um, and once you have the photometry, you can get things like size, color, taxonomy, uh, light curves, rotation, shape, and so forth. To give you a sense of it, one way to think about it is here's the numbered asteroids, uh, numbered asteroids in the 30,000s. Uh, there's 20% of them we've seen 100 times. There's 60% of them we've seen more than 50 times. Uh, conversely, there's 10,000 asteroids that we've seen 120 times, and 100,000 asteroids we've seen 30 times. And so this, um, this number here turns out to be quite significant, as I'll show you in a minute. So, the very first time you look at an asteroid light curve, you're completely horrified. Um, here's, a, here's a random asteroid. It's uh, like, I think it's 12104. It's named after this guy, Chesley. And um, uh, it's just awful. I mean, it varies over two and a half magnitudes over the 600 days we've observed it. 
Uh, it's bright here, gets faint, disappears, gets bright again. This is just basically distance effects and going behind the sun. So it's faint when it's far away and brighter when it gets nearer. We measure it both in the images and the difference images. Uh, and of course, most of this you can immediately take out because you know the uh, orbit of the thing. So you correct to a sort of H magnitude by taking out light travel time effects, distance phase function, and so forth, and you end up with something like this. So here's the 600 days. It's still awful. There's a, there's a magnitude of scatter, but you can start seeing some things. For example, the blue points, which are our cyan filter, start separating from our red points, which are our uh, orange filter. But still, there's this huge scatter. Why is that? Well, uh, excuse me, because the thing is rotating. This thing is spinning six times per day. And so it actually re revolved 1,500 times during this interval when it went behind the sun. But that's okay. There are easy techniques to deal with this. So we just search for the periodicity. We do the usual thing. There's nothing particularly elaborate here. We can phase this thing up, and we can determine an exquisite period because we've observed it for 600 days, and we know the phase of this thing over 600 days. Um, and we can get colors and H magnitudes and all that sort of good stuff. So um, this is fun. We can do this for basically, it turns out, any asteroid that we've observed at least 50 times, and that's about 60,000 of them. How do you know if it's right? What we've been doing is using machine learning and comparison with light curve database to determine whether our, de our determinations are right or not. We're not trying to use machine learning to do a better job of finding periods. We just use conventional stuff, but then we use machine learning to decide whether it's right or not. So if you apply machine learning to a training set from LCDB, the ones where LCDB says we're right, the machine learning says, yes, yes, you're right. When uh, LCDB says you're wrong, machine learning says probability of correct is wrong, it, it, the probability of correct is zero, and so you can classify these things. And then you can go to the full set of 60,000, and this is why I was talking about you need enough observations. It turns out for our density uh, and window function that you really need to have something like 120 observations. But you just pick a box like this, there's 6,400 light curves, you go look at the training set, probability of it being right is 95%, and you can start doing some interesting statistics. So for example, here's um, 30 asteroids starting at 1,000 up to 1029. The background tells you whether the machine learning says the light curve is correct or not. So some of them, obviously, you'd look at this one and say, it's got to be right, and the machine learning says it's right. Some of them you'd look, like, look at and say, hmm, I bet you that's right, but the machine learning says it's wrong. Well, it turns out LCDB agrees that's wrong. And there's some that you look at and you say, oh, that can't be right, but uh, LCDB says it's right. It's really spooky, actually, how well this machine learning works. And once you've done that, you can ask for all sorts of cool stuff. So here's, for example, 30 light curves that are not in the LCDB, and I deliberately asked for ones with really big amplitudes and lots of points and very high probability of being right. So we're just littered with tons and tons of light curves like this. Once you have this, finally, you can start using this photometry to do some interesting stuff. So, for example, the H magnitude, as we just heard, can be related to the uh, diameter if you know something about the albedo. We don't know anything about the albedo, but, you know, uh, this is the comparison between an H magnitude out of LCDB and our H magnitude. You can see there's no biases there. Um, we have very accurate uncertainties, and I think the floor to our magnitudes is somewhere around 0.01 magnitudes. So I don't mean all magnitudes have an accuracy of 0.01, but I mean A will tell you what the accuracy is correctly, and B, if you average enough of them, you'll be able to get down to about 0.01 magnitudes. We also, of course, measure colors because we use this cyan filter, which is kind of an R plus I, and an orange filter, which is kind of, a, sorry, cyan is G plus R, and orange is uh, R plus I, um, depending on whether the moon is up or not. And you can start to say something about the uh, taxonomy of an asteroid just from the optical color. So this is what um, the uh, colors look like for the atlas uh, overlap with LCDB. Uh, the stony asteroids are a little bit redder and the chondrites are a little bit bluer and for some reason the metallic asteroids seem to have a very small distribution in color. Uh, the accuracy of the atlas colors is something like a bin width here. It is you know, the, the spread here is intrinsic to asteroid diversity, not, not the accuracy of the colors. 
You can also say cool things about the kinematics once you know rotation curves. So for example, if you pick out about 4,000 asteroids with a probability of being right of greater than 0.95, and you plot, for example, the spin frequency against H magnitude, uh, there's this thing called the spin barrier that everybody knows about, which basically says if you take an asteroid and you spin it up faster and faster and faster and it's gravity bound, it'll fly apart if it goes faster than about 10 revs per day. We see that very clearly. Um, and obviously, uh, we see other effects such as the RMS gets larger as you go to fainter, smaller asteroids, um, uh, presumably because they're more elongated. You can pick out a certain range, let's say around 10 kilometers, and look at a histogram here. So pay attention now. You're, this, is, this is your stuff. You're going to really like this. So there is this interesting spike near slow rotators that Pravich has been talking about. And this thing here, this missing thing, um, we don't know whether uh, we're correct at this point because this is so hot off the computer, it's steaming. But um, there's just an enormous amount of, of information that can be found here. Once you understand something about the kinematics here and you understand something about the systematics, you can use this to address all sorts of questions that you might have about astrodynamics. And this really has to do with NEOs and the asteroid hazard because uh, a significant populator of the new NEOs that could hit us arises from asteroid fission, for example. So maybe you think that um, if torque goes as area and moment, goes, moment of inertia goes as uh, volume and you apply it for fixed time interval, then the frequency should go as the inverse size. And you could talk about a torque line and say, ooh, they start here and they go faster and faster and faster until they fission or something like that. You know, there's enough information here you can test this. Alternatively, um, Alan and uh, Pravich uh, basically pointed out that if you have an elongated asteroid and you start spinning it up, it'll fly apart at a smaller critical frequency than if it's round. Um, just because it's more elongated, there's more centrifugal force. Alternatively, you could say, well, gee, maybe they don't stay fixed in their shape. Maybe they slump as you take a round thing and spin it up faster and faster and faster, it gets stretched out in which case you might say, oh, well, it's going to move at fixed angular momentum along a slump line. And I'm not going to tell you anything about which is better, but the point is the data are now accessible to uh, address these things. So anyway, that's ATLAS. That's what we're doing. Uh, obviously, our main mission is finding dangerous asteroids. We'll keep doing that. We'll be doing it a factor of a lot better now that the Schmidt corrector is fixed. Um, within a year, we should have H magnitudes and colors for about 100,000 asteroids. Um, probably rotation period for a lot of them. Um, we can give 30-minute latency alerts for interesting events like collisions and cometary outbursts and whatnot. And we're also proposing to build Atlas 3 and 4 uh, in uh, South Africa and some other place to improve our longitude, latitude, and weather diversity. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you're not going to disappoint me by talking about light curves. <laughs> Uh, that's really nice, interesting stuff. Could you flip back a couple slides there? We're going to have to move on here. This, no, the one, that, no, forward. Uh, sorry, forward, forward, yeah, yeah. forward. Uh, yes. This one right over here. Yes. Basically, if you assume this is about the mean spin rate, this is about the biggest guys that can be spun down to zero. Right. Now, it, takes, it turns out you've got to spin up by a factor of about three or four from the mean to hit the spin barrier. And so the slope that you see over here is just, you see the comparable slope over here, things, how much they can spin down. Yep. So that's easily explained. And, uh, yep. and nice data. It's good. Yep. Um, unless there's an urgent question, I think we better move on. OK. Our uh, next talk is a substitution. Uh, Eric Christensen won't be able to be here until tomorrow, so we have uh, substituted instead uh, a talk from session three by uh, H.K. Moon, uh, who was going to talk tomorrow, but he will talk next in this session. In a talk, that, though, that closely relates to the same subject, so I don't think we've really messed up the subject flow very much. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to um, brief on the progress and prospects of our project. Well, for decades, uh, large-scale annual uh, observation projects have been very successful. And of course, they uh, focused 
uh, mostly on discovery. Uh, this is why only a small fraction of the annual population has been um, known for their uh, physical properties. On the other hand, uh, it is also a problem that um, most uh, telescope uh, for annual studies have largely uh, distributed in the Northern Hemisphere and we do not have uh, 1.0 larger uh, telescope, dedicated telescope for annual studies in Southern Hemisphere. So this asymmetric distribution of facilities in um, geographic uh, latitude uh, may bias the known uh, population. Well, so um, we decided to propose to use Korea Micro Lensing Telescope Network in brief KMTNet, uh, a dedicated uh, facility for um, extrasolar planet search using a micro lensing event. Um, it is consisted of three identical 1.6 meter prime focus telescopes with 18K, 18K CCDs. Uh, this combination provides four square degrees field of view with a plate scale of 0.4 arc second per pixel, which is very good for um, crowded field photometry uh, towards galactic bulge, especially. Well, they were located in Cerro Tololo, Chile, uh, Sutherland, South Africa, and um, Siding Spring, Australia. And they were um, well separated in geographic uh, longitude, so um, it is good for um, follow astrometry as well as uh, photometric, uh, time series photometric for um, NEOs. Well, deep ecliptic petrol of the southern sky, uh, in brief, Deep South, is the, one of the secondary science projects of the uh, KMTNet, and it, it aims for a uh, survey and characterization of small solar system objects, include near Earth object population. We have um, several a number of uh, observation modes for the Deep South. The most frequently used one is OC, that stands for All Position Census. It is for um, um, targeted observations of uh, kilometer-sized uh, near-Earth asteroids and PHAs that comes close to a position. And NW is the um, the one for object that uh, were or are going to come within the field of view of any wise. And um, very recently, a student was allocated for this, this work. And we also have some targetive, uh, target of opportunity observation. And we are um, establishing a detailed strategy for observation of uh, ecliptic survey and um, as well as uh, sweet spot survey in search for Atens and Atiras. Uh, well, this uh, sweet spot survey mode will be um, implemented um, well every three sites in the, in the early morning and, and in the evening for the three sites, and um, it will be done uh, regardless of time allocation for our project. Well, um, we used the Kempton telescope during the six months in the up season for exoplanet search, and mostly uh, we used Johnson Cousins PBRI uh, filters while the very uh, short period of time we use uh, Sloan GRIZ uh, only at CTIO within a, uh, on one week or so. Because other um, project which we, we share time with 
are not using um, um, Sloan bands. And um, as for opposition census, uh, the observation scheduling software has been fully um, uh, automated while uh, the reduction pipeline has mostly automated for this um, observation mode. Milestones. Well, we, um, the, net, uh, the site construction was completed in the end of 2015, at, and at the same time, the full-scale operations at the, at the three sites in the southern hemisphere uh, started uh, at the same time. Uh, we started um, Deep South software subsystem development uh, in the beginning of 2015 because we were fully funded at the time and um, well script observation is expected to be started uh, in the end of this year. Well with this Deep South project um, we obtain uh, the the we obtain orbit from astrometry while we get um, absolute magnitude, uh, rotational periods, and um, spin states from uh, the time series for photometry. And based on the light curve uh, we obtained, we uh, may be able to construct uh, the 3D um, convex shape model of, of part of the target. And based on uh, multiband uh, photometry, we are able to um, determine approximate taxonomy and combining taxonomy and that um, uh, H magnitude, we may um, estimate just rough, rough uh, size and the mass of the targeted object. Uh, therefore, uh, we may be able to uh, also calculate some rough estimate for um, impact energy uh, for, an, for um, potential impactors in the future. Well, so software subsystem. Well, as we monitor uh, the almost all NEOs, so um, the Deep South server regularly uh, updates the ephemeris of those objects by assessing the server at the Minor Planet Center. Then the Deep South server um, prepares a list of targets after checking the um, um, observability such as daylight time, observation time span, elevation cut, signal to noise ratio, uh, etc. and etc. Then the OCF, which stands for Observation Command File, is automatically generated and sent to the site operators uh, before 3 o'clock in the afternoon in local time at every site. This is a part of the table um, we uh, obtained uh, during the test run observations at CTIO and the full scale uh, operations at the three sites of the KMTNet uh, in the following season. Uh, you can see that um, there are some preliminary uh, rotational periods in the second column and in the third column uh, they are just uh, preliminary uh, values for amplitude or the the lower, lower um, the minimum value, I mean, the, um, well, the, the, the estimation for lowest and highest value for, for those um, parameters. And these are the, the example of a uh, light curve we obtained during the period. And um, I'll show you some interesting objects. Uh, these are the light curves uh, that exhibit um, the obvious advantages uh, we have uh, through the round, round the clock observation um, at the three KMTNet sites. So you can see that uh, different 
uh, data points with different colors that um, show uh, the different dates and, and the different uh, locations of observations. And these two guys are uh, fast, fast rotating uh, near Earth asteroids. Uh, so the left one is rotation period is about 3.7 hours, and the right one is about 2.4 hours. And this one is um, 2011 UW158. It is a well-known asteroid uh, of uh, NASA's human space flight uh, target study object. And it was also observed at um, perhaps Arecibo and Goldstone. And this one and this one here are considered to be the typical, um, well, binary asteroids that are in the near Earth space that uh, which shows show the uh, well that shoulders which uh, Alan Harris is referring. Yes, and the last one perhaps is um, 215 TB1, 145 is the, um, the one which approached the Earth um, very closely, uh, perhaps in um, October 2015. And it was also targeted by Arecibo, Goldstone, and um, Green Bank observatories at the time. This is another interesting object uh, called Krulov. It is, although a main belt asteroid, uh, but um, you see the light curve cannot be fooled uh, with a single um, period. And it was listed by Peter Frabeck and others uh, with a ca some candidate object for, for um, tumbling motion. And uh, with an analysis of this light curve, uh, we um, obtained uh, some important physical parameters. And based on that parameters, we uh, reconstructed the 3D uh, convex shape model um, with um, uh, Joseph Durek. Of course, we are going to uh, apply the same method to the asteroids in the near Earth uh, space in the future. Now, um, 3D taxonomy. Well, the currently used um, asteroid taxonomical classification scheme. All right. Sorry. Okay. Um, well, we defined another color for GRIZ, and um, we applied clustering methods. And you see that um, using Sloan Digital Sky Survey MOC4 data, you can see the red one for uh, S-complex, blue one for uh, carbonaceous, and the X for X, um, the, the, the violet for, for X, and the green dots for um, V-type asteroids. And um, we obtained the uh, class centers for each color. And um, if we add some trained algorithm, we can further um, um, separate uh, D, K, and L subclasses here. So, um, yes, e, for Ion's perspective, we, can, uh, we are supposed to do this kind of things, and this is a summary of my talk. Thank you. I'm sorry we're out of time for questions. Uh, I did enjoy both your talk and John Tonnery's, and with all those light curves and stuff in reference to the light curve database, I would encourage you to get results submitted in such a way that we can include them in the light curve database so others can use these results, uh, summarize them, and so forth. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comments. I think we have to move on now to the next talk, which was uh, Steve Chesley, and he's going to tell us about the LSST.
Let me see Chester. Please, please. Okay, yay again. Steve Chesley from JPL. Um, I'm elated to learn today that my asteroid has a light curve. <laughs> Would have been pretty awkward otherwise. Um, and I'm going to talk about LSST, which is not an operating survey. It's a, it's a survey that's in development now. I want to acknowledge my collaborator, Peter Verage, who worked with me for uh, about two years on this and so I have about you know, 10 or 12 minutes to cover two years of work. We might um, cut some corners. But first, a bit about the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Uh, it's set for first light about three years from now and, and should be initially starting its survey about five years from now. It has a number of science drivers and the solar system is one of the, the key four science drivers for the mission. Um, and that's, of course, where the NEO search comes in. It's got a large aperture, a lot of pixels, and a large, large field of view here. 24.1 uh, is the R-band magnitude, a little bit fainter than that in V-band. And um, that's a realized faint limit. If you talk about the faint limit of a telescope at say at that low air mass in dark sky, it's actually a mag or, or, or more fainter than that. Um, and about 10,000 square degrees per night in a, a single visit mode and returning 15 terabytes of data. So it's an ambitious project, undoubtedly. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to understand is, is how is this going to work for near Earth object search? Um, in particular, it's because LSST is not planning to revisit a field three, four, and five times as is the traditional means of, of NEO survey. They're only going to visit a field two times per night in general. And so will they be able to link those detections of moving objects in the presence of a lot of false detections? And then if the linking does work, how many objects are they going to find for the NEO search? So for this work, we use the moving object processing system called MOPS. Some of you already know very well about that system. Um, but it requires some inputs. And uh, the, we, we used uh, an NEO population model here. This is just uh, showing the size frequency distribution down to uh, absolute magnitude of 25. Most of a million objects coming from, in this case, the Granvik NEO model. We also used uh, the Grav main belt model here, which has uh, uh, upwards of 10 million, or, or I guess it's uh, 14 million main belt asteroids that were in our model. And we basically combine that with the Opsium output. And here's a, a sort of an animation on the right of what LSST is doing night by night in their baseline survey. And, um, and so this includes the realistic weather, actually from historical records, and downtime for service and so forth, and it provides some key information for us to evaluate the LSST performance. In particular, we get the time, the pointing for the exposures, the limiting magnitude that depends, of course, on seeing and, and uh, sky background and so forth. Um, there's the filter information and also the proposal information, which is basically saying, why were you shooting this particular field? And there's, there's about five, there they are, uh, with these peculiar codes. And here is a depiction of what they are. This blue area is the wide, fast, deep. That's the main dark energy, dark matter survey. Most of the time is spent on that, and it's actually very effective for near-Earth object search. There's also some less effective that, uh, searches on the galactic plane, the south celestial pole, these deep drilling fields, there's just a few hot spots here where they drill for a very long time in a given night. And there's this northern ecliptic spur up here, which is just for the solar system inventory. So if you take the population and those pointings and you can now develop a, a model of your detections, so you need a focal plane model. And for LSST, it's fairly straightforward, though, though impressive, I think. There's a, 189 4K CCDs in a single focal plane, 
is there's rotational dithering that's built into the survey that we, we actually model correctly. <coughs> and there are chip gaps among all of these CCDs and that gives you about a 91% fill factor. So there's a say 9% probability that your detection is gonna fall on a gap and be lost. Some other model details we, we look for. Uh, I mentioned the fill factor. This is a plot showing the probability of you getting the detection for a given uh, delta magnitude from your limiting magnitude here at zero. And you see that the black line is getting you, the best you can do is your fill factor, 91%. And then you have this gradual tail off around the limiting magnitude. So we call that fading. We also include trailing losses, which are particular, particularly important for LSST because of the way they're doing their detections. We explored color variations among asteroids, light curve variations among asteroids, and vignetting, which is a, a, an issue with the telescope design, especially for these wide format focal planes. So if you take a look and, and you have a, 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 on the top here, this is the, the number of asteroids that you see in red one time in 10 years, which is not good enough to do much with, but it shows sort of the upper bound of what the telescope could do. And um, we're looking particularly at the H of 22, which is roughly 140 meters. If we look instead at, at getting the discoveries, which in our case are tracks, 20-day tracks, that's, that's essentially the three detections, uh, I'm sorry, six detections over three nights, two per night, and that within 20 days, or sometimes you do it within 12 days, depending on the, what we're trying to understand, well, you get, for all of these important modeling issues, you get a 6 or 8% cut in your performance for the survey. So these are the kind of details that we want to make sure that we captured in the analysis. Another question that we wanted to answer was this business about uh, two, vi two visits per night. Is that really going to work? And if it doesn't, well, we might have to, uh, the project might have to revert to three or four visits per night as a survey mode. So here's uh, three examples of Opsium outputs, and they have their curious names, but you can see that the red is two per night, green is three per night, blue is four per night. And um, over here, you get this performance in, in, say, if you want to just look at the solid lines in 20-day tracks. So you have about, at age of 22, integral completeness, you have in, say, 63% with pairs. And because you're visiting more sky, or rather less sky, with more visits, you get a degradation in the system performance as you have more visits per night. Okay, so definitely this is, uh, this is an optimal but extremely challenging place to operate. So the next question is whether or not you can successfully link these two visits per night in the presence of all these false detections. So if you have three, you sort of have independent confirmation that your object is, say, has a linear motion. You have two points and, and the third con is a confirmation. If you just have two, virtually every single possible pair has to be analyzed for possibility of being real. So here's an example. I don't know if you can see um, black versus the blue points here would indicate um, the first image, first visit, and the second visit. So you have see one in the center, you have a search circle that's given by some rate of motion limitation, which in our case was about 1.2 degrees per day. And every single possible pair in that circle, which includes a lot of false detections, has to be analyzed for possible linking. If it's moving faster than about 1.2 degrees per day, it's gonna trail out. You only have to search one or, or both of these small regions based on the motion itself. You don't know the direction, so you have to search both directions. Um, for this kind of linking analysis, you have to do all the asteroids plus all the false detections to really test the system. We ran it for one month, and that came up with 66 million detections, about a three to one ratio, false to real moving object detections. You also have to include astrometric errors because you're moving all the way through the linking process to the orbit determination stage. How dense is full density for LSST? 
There's one field on the right at uh, optimal conditions. This is on the ecliptic at low air mass near opposition. Over here on the left, you have uh, for varying seeing levels. It's plotted by seeing for one month of operating the telescope at different seeing. So you can see at, at good seeing, you're getting a lot of main belt and NEO detections up to 5,000 per field. We have two kinds of false detections. These are different image artifacts at about 1,800 per field. And then random Gaussian statistics on the, on the pixels. And this is giving you a typical seeings that LSST experiences is uh, most of 1,000, say. So you're having up, upwards of six, 7,000 detections per field in the best observing conditions. So that's a lot of false detections. Um, and there was the, 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 I think the answer to the obvious question is, is this, it's not that bad. If you take the 66 million that you started with, 51 of those were false, 15 million are main belt asteroids. And you look what came through in the, at the end in the NEO catalog, there's about 30,000 detections in the one month NEO catalog. And only five of those detections are spurious. So you have a 99.98% um, purity in your astrometric catalog um, for, the final, for the final linkage. So that's the purity. The other question is, did you miss any? And, and so there's this uh, pretty simple equation. How many objects were uh, found versus how many could have been found with, in this case, 12-day tracks? We found a 90 3.6% efficiency for the H brighter than 22 population. Um, this does assume masking around bright sources to reduce the false positive rate. Um, and so that's a 1% reduction in fill factor. So we have a, essentially a 94% efficiency, which I think can be improved uh, significantly by tuning of MOPs. And we have very high accuracy, actually 100% essentially accuracy on the NEOs that are in the NEO catalog. Um, so my time is getting short. I'm just gonna say that uh, the final answer is 55% complete with about 5% error bars. And those are not Gaussian error bars. Those are basically our assessment of what the modeling, the different sources of modeling error can, can lead to. Um, you can do a little bit better for PHAs. You can do a little bit better if you stretch to 20-day tracks instead of 12-day tracks. It's basically allowing longer times, longer, more time to make the discovery. Um, but this assumes LSSC starts with an empty catalog and operates by itself, which is interesting from the perspective of understanding LSST, um, but maybe not so realistic. So you can look at... Uh, sort of a rudimentary model for what the surveys have done and will do in the past, and that's what we've done here. So the black is actually what's happened up till now, time zero, and the red is our model. You can see we tuned it to get to where we are now, and then we let it run out um, to the end of the LSST survey. It's about 43% when LSST starts and a little over 60% at the end of the 10-year baseline LSST survey. Here's the LSST, LSST operating alone. And then this top red curve um, is LSST operating in concert with the existing survey programs. And you see this, so this wedge here essentially is what LSST would be bringing to the NEO search program. Um, that's not a lot of space, but it is a lot of uh, data. I can say that. So as I mentioned, I, I've cut a lot of corners. The key, the key uh, conclusions are that you can link pairs and you can get a high completeness and, um, and purity for the NEO catalog. There's some numbers here that I already discussed about the ultimate performance. We think that 90% is unachievable with LSST, even with existing survey operations without some major alterations to the survey. There is a lengthy and comprehensive report that hopefully answers a lot of questions that I've, I haven't been able to talk much about. That's available at our website uh, at slash doc, or you just go to extras and documents and you'll have your own copy. That's all. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, just to emphasize that you said once, maybe should have said two or three times, that this H of 22 corresponds to 140 meter diameter with a kind of canonical conversion, and that's sort of somebody's magic number of how far you should survey. Yeah, and 22 is just, uh, is you there can do the quick, metrics at a different number if you yeah, like. Is there a quick question out there, or shall we move on? Ed? I don't. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Ed's asking if we explored the completeness. Yeah, that's. Uh, I don't. I don't know how much time we have. That's. That's here in the charts. There's a. There's a lot of these plots in the in the report itself. For instance, so down at 25, the LSSD operating alone would get you to say 18 percent or something like that. Okay. Okay. I think we better move on now to our uh, last talk. Uh, which will be uh, um, uh, Ryu uh, Osama, Osama? Osawa. Osawa, sorry. Uh. <coughs> uh, uh. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm Ryo Osawa from the University of Tokyo. In this presentation, I'll introduce our project, uh, Camera, a survey project and the possible contributions in the planetary defense. So and, uh, our project is supported by these facilities. I expect our appreciation for this cooperation. This is the outline of the presentation. So first, I'll present and introduce the importance of observations for small and close NEOs. Then I'll show our project development of a new wide field mosaic CMOS camera, Tomoe Gozen. In the last, the performance of the Tomoe Gozen is discussed. So a number of nearest objects have been detected in large surveys. As shown in the previous presentations, the Catalina and the Pansard have made a great contribution in this field. So I think I don't need to explain this uh, figure. So a uh, number of uh, NEO are detected. And uh, in 2016, about uh, 2,000 NEOs were newly detected. And advances in instrumentation enable us to detect smaller and smaller NEOs. And the large synoptic survey telescope, LSST, will start its operation. And, uh, uh, and a large fraction of the NEOs uh, larger than 100 meters will be discovered in several years. This is really amazing. However, the Earth is still exposed to risk asteroid impact. This figure is from presentation by Alan Harris uh, in 2014, so a bit uh, older one. So this shows the cumulative size distribution of the yields and the corresponding impact frequencies. So, okay. The NEO larger than 100 meter will be uh, covered by uh, the future uh, large survey. And the impact events by uh, such uh, uh, large class object uh, will occur once in, uh, expected to occur in 10,000 years. Instead, impact by a 20 meter class object will occur once in 100 years. Actually, we had Tunguska and Chelbinsk. Such an impact event will cause a disastrous damage in uh, several 10 kilometer scale. So detection of the 20-meter class NEO is practically important. Uh, a survey with a large telescope, like a 30-meter telescope, is promising to detect small asteroids, but operat operation time is very limited. It's not practical. So here, we propose another approach. Use one-meter telescope and use a mosaic CMOS camera. So next, uh, let me introduce our observatory and uh, instrument. We are developing a new camera for one-meter telescope at Kiso Observatory. So, uh, Kiso Observatory is a very small observatory located at the middle of Japan and owned by University of Tokyo since the uh, 1970s. And this observatory has a one meter Schmidt telescope. This has a large image circle of nine degree in diameter. We are developing a new wide field mosaic CMOS camera for this telescope named Tomoe Gozen. That Tomoe Gozen will be a new flagship instrument at Kiso Observatory. And this is an overview of the Tomoe Gozen camera. We have developed a new CMOS sensor with Canon. 
The sensor had 2K by 1K format, and we are planning to uh, fill out entire the imaging circle with 84 CMOS sensors. And the covering area is about 20 square degrees in total. And specifications are listed here. And, uh, <clears throat> and one of the most striking features of the Tomoe Oden is um, exposure time here. So since rolling shutter is implemented, no mechanical shutter is required. The nominal shortest exposure time is 0.5 seconds, and the images are continuously obtained. That uh, Tomoe Oden can monitor sky like movie camera. So I think this is the world's largest moving camera. <laughs> so and, uh, as a pilot project, we developed a prototype of the Tomoe Godan equipped with eight SEMO sensors aligned in the array direction. The, this, this is a photograph. So and the specifications are all of the same except for the number of the chips. And the commissioning of the uh, prototype was in December 2015, and this uh, bottom uh, photo is taken by the prototype. Uh, this is the uh, Orion B in the region. And we confirmed that the limiting magnitude was about 18.5 uh, magnitude in 0.5 second exposure. Uh, this table compares the specifications of the Tomoe Gozen uh, with Panzer and Catalina and the SST. So among them, Tomoe Gozen had shallowest limiting magnitude. But uh, the shortest exposure is available. Uh, several science cases have been proposed for the Tomoe Gozen, say in uh, transient surveys, debris, meteors, and the asteroid occultations, and so on. Of course, we are planning a large survey project. Then, uh, this Tomoe's performance allows us to conduct a wide area survey in a high cadence. So we explain our survey uh, program. The observation strategy is a bit tricky. So first, telescope is pointed, and six images are obtained in a row at two hertz. And then telescope is shifted, and another six images are obtained. And a nine degree circle is almost covered by two by two dithering. And then telescope is pointed to the next circle, and repeat and repeat. So, and in this survey, we can cover about 10,000 square uh, degree uh, every two hours without losing the sub-second time resolution. So, although this survey is originally intended to detect transient events like supernovae, we are confident that a number of NEOs will be detected in this survey. So, and in this survey, the same sky will be visited three or four times in a night. This survey will be very helpful to determine the orbit of any yield with large apparent motion. So, and uh, uh, let's uh, move on to the next part. And we roughly estimate the detectability of small 20 meter cloth in yield with a Tomoe Ozan. So, we use one meter, one meter telescope to detect a, such a small any yield, the distance to the object should be small. And in such a case, the motion during the integration is not negligible. So the, due to the motion of the object, object will appear as a line segment, as shown before. Uh, the surface brightness of the object will decrease accordingly. So uh, this is a trail loss. So this uh, is a mock image. And uh, this object and this object has the, total, uh, the same total amount of signal. But uh, because of the motion, the, this object has lower surface brightness. So some algorithms are available to recover this uh, loss, trail loss, but they are uh, in general time consuming. So, and the degree of the, this trail loss is almost proportional to the, this ratio, the uh, pixel crossing time of the object over a total exposure time. So this means that the shorter exposure time is preferable for fast moving object. So the Tomoe Gozen is, uh, so the tom data obtained by the Tomoe Gozen is less affected by the trail loss thanks to the shorter exposure time. So under, uh, to estimate the advantage of the Tomoe Gozen, we assume a very simple case. The sun and the earth and the NEO here, and the distance is D and the size is L, and the zero phase angle. And the relative velocity of the NEO to the earth is roughly approximated by the capillarian uh, rotation. 
And then we calculate the distance to the uh, uh, object, uh, where the object is first detected with a signal-to-noise ratio of five, in, taking into account the trail loss. And this figure shows the result. The horizontal axis shows the distance to the object, and the vertical axis shows the size of the object. And the lines indicate the detection limit. So, uh, and here, uh, the albedo is assuming 0.3. I think this is a bit uh, large, larger value than normal. So, and the left side of the line indicate the observable region in the phase space. So the, the normal, uh, uh, the nominal integration time for these uh, survey, LSST, Pransad, and Catalina, are uh, longer than 10 seconds. Thus, uh, these surveys uh, are affected by the trail-off from these distances, say, uh, 1 AU. And this slope means uh, they're affected by the trail-offs. Instead, the data obtained with the Tomoe Gozen is uh, not affected by the trail-offs down to this uh, distance, about 0.01 AU. So, and as a result, so uh, Tomoe Gozen can detect about uh, 10 meter cross object at a distance of 0.01 AU. So, and we, we use, uh, if, if we use one meter side telescope, the uh, performance of the uh, Tomoe Gozen is not so bad compared with LSSD in this case. So, and this is the summary of my talk. So, I introduced our project at Kiso Observatory. We are developing a wide field mosaic CMOS camera, Tomoe Gozen. So, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, our investigation suggests that a movie like survey with a mosaic CMOS camera provided another approach to small, uh, very small 2 mm class NEOs. So, and we are developing the Tomoe Gozen step by step. And in the end of this year, we are planning. Uh, the first light of the Tomoe Gozen with the 21 image sensors. And the full operation of Tomoe Gozen is scheduled in the winter of 2018. We hope that the data obtained by the Tomoe Gozen will be helpful in the field of planetary defense. So finally, I'll show a short movie. Can you identify the small dot here? So this is not an um, asteroid. This is Hayabusa 2, <laughs> Japanese asteroid explorer. This movie was obtained during the uh, Earth swing by no, Hayabusa 2. And uh, this movie is obtained at two hertz and here to here uh, about uh, 30 arc seconds. So this movie is a demonstration that Tomoe Gozen can capture a, such a fast moving object like this. Okay, yes, that's all. Thank you for the listening. Uh, if you take into account the fact of time, I mean, if you can discover an asteroid 0.01 AU, the time, if it is an impactor, the time to impact is one, maximum two days. Isn't, this is too late. Oh, it's too late, okay. I Okay. Yes, okay. Is there a microphone coming? Here it comes. So, um, have you heard of the digital synthetic tracking technique for discovering asteroids? Uh, so, uh, di digital is shift and the quad. Uh, shift and out. Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I know. I, I have never tried, but we are very interested in such technique. Yeah, I think the fact that you have a CMOS detector that can read at two hertz means you might be able to do very well with that technique, and, and I think you could investigate it. Yes, so in this sense, uh, Yanagisawa-san uh, over there uh, gave us uh, very uh, and good information about such techniques, and we are uh, expecting to in include it. Okay, excellent, thank you. Okay, any other question? 
Okay, at this point we have a break for 15 minutes and then Paul Chodas will tell us if we're all gonna die and if so, when?